In December of every year, every church has a bathrobed shepherd, aluminum foil, haloed angels, a Joseph leading a very pregnant Mary to Bethlehem. We know the story of no room in the inn, but a kind innkeeper offering the stable in the back. Mary and Joseph make their way there. It must be much quieter than the busyness of the roadhouse. They're met by lowing cattle, perhaps a braying donkey, a bleeding sheep. It's quiet. That quiet is Christmas to me. I enjoy walking after dark where the only sound is the crunch of snow under your foot. Perhaps to feel a snowflake on my cheek. And in that quiet know the presence of God. One hundred years ago, this year, my favorite poet penned the words that we sang in our high school choir. Robert Frost wrote, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. And it bears the very mark of Christmas to me. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake, the only sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep on miles to go before I sleep. Merry Christmas. This is Bill Peak. Trinity and Merry Christmas. I thought I would share my contribution for the living postcard. Um, I would like to start by reading you some text from our Gospel of Luke chapter 2 and I will be reading from the inclusive New Testament written by the priests for equality. So listen for the word of God. In those days, Caesar Augustus published a decree ordering a census over the whole Roman world. 
The first census took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All the people were instructed to go back to the towns of their birth to register. And so Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the city of David, Bethlehem in Judea, because Joseph was of the house and lineage of David. He went to register with Mary, his espoused wife, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to, to deliver. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She put him in a simple cloth wrapped like a receiving blanket and laid him in a feeding trough for cattle because there was no room at the end. There were shepherds in the area living in the fields and keeping night watch by turns over their flock. The angel of God appeared to them and the glory of God shone around them and they were very much afraid. The angel said to them, you have nothing to fear. I come to proclaim good news to you, news of a great joy to be shared by the whole people. Today in David City, a Savior, the Messiah, has been born to you. Let this be a sign to you. You'll find an infant wrapped in a simple cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in high heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom God's favor rests. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see this event that God has made known to us. They hurried and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Once they saw this, they reported what they had been told concerning the child. All who heard about it were astonished at the report given to them by the shepherds. Mary treasured all these things and reflected on them in her heart. The shepherds went away glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the part that I thought I would focus on was the gift that we see in our text today from Luke's Gospel. So I'd like to share from you a little story, and this is from a book called Art Talks with Mother God. It is written by Mary, Bridget Mary Meehan and Regina Madonna Oliver, illustrated by Betsy Bowen, Barbara Knudsen, and Susan Sawyer. So Heart Talks with Mother God. And our theme being a gift, the gift. Um, that's what I want you to listen for in this story today. Mary had a baby. Oh, how she loves him. She holds him and coos at him. She sings him a lullaby and rocks him. It's a very special and tender moment. She feels very rich, like her baby is all hers. But then there's a noise outside the stable. Someone calls out, what do you want? We want to see the newborn king. We were in the fields with our sheep when an angel of God told us to come to Bethlehem where we would find a newborn baby with his mother. He is the promised one who will save us all from sin. Mary's lullaby stops. She holds her baby close to her heart and soothes him. With the caress of her words, it's all right, little one, it's all right. The door of the stable opens and several shepherds and shepherd boys and girls, they step inside along with a few stray sheep. One little shepherd is holding a soft, woolly lamb. We have come to see your baby, dear lady, the older shepherd tells her. We want to honor him. The angel says that he is the promised savior. Well, Mary smiles, but something inside her tugs. This is her baby. Now the shepherd is reminding her that Jesus belongs to them too, and to everyone. May I hold him? asked the little shepherd, putting down the woolly lamb. Oh, this lamb is a present for Jesus. She's my very own. I call her Rama, but I want Jesus to have her. Mary says, I thank you, little shepherd, and Jesus thanks you even though he's too little to say so. Mary gives baby Jesus to the little shepherd to hold and to rock. 
She strokes Rama, running her fingers through her curly wool. All the shepherds gather around the little shepherd. They coo at the newborn baby. And they giggle when he screws and smushes up his face. They ooh and ah when he opens his eyes. Each one of them wants a turn to hold him. Mary has given over her precious treasure. She knows Jesus is not hers only. Jesus is everyone's. Jesus is also yours to hold. Mary gives him to you. Mary gives him to us. Mary gives. God is like this. God gives. God gives her most precious gift, the gift of Jesus. And God holds nothing back. Mary's giving reminds us that Mother God gives Jesus to you. God gives Jesus to all of us. God gives. And the picture that comes along with that story, it's so tender. You can see the shepherds holding baby Jesus and Mary gently holding the little lamb Rama. It's an invitation for us to remember and to embrace, and to praise, and to live into that gift giving. So the natural invitation might be for you to reflect upon the ways that you give, but also what has been the most treasured gift that you have received. For Mary, I dare say it would be Jesus, but the look of endearment on her eyes, I might say that the gift of the baby lamb Rama also might be a very tender gift to her. So as we walk through this season of Advent and now into the season of Christmas, I invite you to think about not only the most tender gift that you have given, but what was the most tender gift that you have received? Um, I'd like to close by sharing with you um, a poem. And this poem is by um, uh, a woman. Her name is um, Carol Penner. She's actually a Mennonite pastor, but she invites us to reflect on this idea of the best Christmas gift. So let's listen to her words. Christ comes as a gift into your life, but he doesn't come wrapped in shiny paper and ribbons. And you can't say, isn't that nice? As quickly as you slide him under your bed or store him in a dark closet, thinking that someday you'll find a place to put him. Christ is a gift that you can't pack away neatly in a box, bringing him out for special holidays like Christmas or Easter. There isn't a place in the house where you can put him and leave him because the gift is always by your side. The gift of Christ is one of those noisy Christmas gifts whispering in the night, crying out during the day at unexpected times. Do you love me? He whispers. Feed my sheep, he cries. Where do you put this gift? In your heart, in your mind, in your soul. Pretty soon this gift has taken over your life. I had no idea how time consuming this gift would be, you'll say. And sometimes you'll wonder about the no return policy. But mostly you will fall in love with the gift of Christ. You will soon lose yourself in this gift. You will find yourself in this gift. About this gift, you will say from the deepest part of your soul, thank you. This is just what I've always wanted. Christmas blessings to you and those you hold dear. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in
Christmas and happy holidays from Scott and Laura Vanderveer. God bless. I, I want to say Merry Christmas to everyone. And uh, I'm so happy that, you know, I have my family here with me. And uh, we thank God that, you know, we, we, have, we, we have come, you know, through the, all the, the hardship from uh, the past two years from COVID and everything, and we all are doing great. Thank you so We thank God for, for everything. Merry Christmas to everyone, and we wish everyone the same. Merry Christmas to everyone. We give praise to God for the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and I hope everyone has a great holiday. Merry Christmas to everyone, and I hope everybody has a blessed holiday. Merry Christmas, everyone. We're thankful to be here this year. Um, I'm extremely thankful that um, I am off of work this year and I'm able to celebrate with Trinity Presbyterian Church. And uh, we extend our love from the Mosessa family to Trinity. Rejoice, rejoice with all the world shall come to
On this Christmas morning, I would like to read a story for you, for you from the book called The Seven Stories of Christmas Love by Leo Boscaglia. The name of this particular little story in this book is called A Gift of Ravioli. And let me just say it up front that I believe this is something that Leo as a child experienced himself. <clears throat> When I was a child, I had a crush on a librarian. Once a week, she held a story hour in the garden of our neighborhood library. She read to us wonderful tales of adventure, fantasy, and beauty. I was never absent from these sessions. In fact, I would often arrive hours early to assure myself a seat in the front row so as not to miss a single word. I remember vividly the Christmas when she read, Henry Van Dyke's The Story of the Other Wise Men. I was only eight or nine years old. Usually she read many stories in the allotted hour, but on this occasion, she read only one. After the reading was over, she hugged us all a Merry Christmas. She took me by the hand and walked me outside through the library. She knelt down beside me and smiled. I've got a Christmas present for you. I want to give you the book I've just read. She handed me her copy of the story of the other wise men. Did you enjoy the story, she asked. Frankly, I really didn't understand it, but of course I was not going to tell her that. Instead, I said, yes, it was very interesting. In actuality, the story had confused me. I couldn't imagine that anyone would be so insane as to give up for any reason, being present in Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. Nor could I understand that a person would give rubies and pearls intended for, the, for Christ's birthday present to cruel soldiers and conniving death collectors. I recall that I went straight home clutching the little book in my hand, determined to read it once more. Surely if my wonderful friend loved the book, I would too. As many know, the story tells of the magical voyage of the three wise men of the East, how they traveled from afar, guided by a single star, to bear gifts to a newborn king who was lying in a manger in Bethlehem. But it suggests that there was a fourth wise man, of whom I'd never heard, who also saw a star in the East and set off on the long, arduous journey to join the other wise men, bearing his precious gifts. According to the story, the three wise men had no trouble getting to Bethlehem, but the fourth, Artaban, had nothing but problems. First, he meets a sick Hebrew exile, alone and dying in the desert. Overcome with pity, he stops and ministers to the sick man. This delay causes him to miss his rendezvous with the other wise men, and as a result, he misses being present in the manger on that magical first Christmas. Still, he travels on. Not long afterward, he gives away one of the gifts intended for the newborn child in order to save the life of another infant, who, by Herod's decree, had been condemned to die. Time after time, he stops to minister to the sick, comfort the oppressed and imprisoned, and feed the hungry. As the story ends, Artaban is despairing and very tired. He realizes that he has been on his search for 33 years, ending by finding himself in Golgotha. Here he discovers that the Son of God, whom he had so many years ago set out to find, has been condemned to die on the, death, on the cross. He immediately thinks of his very last possession, a pearl. He feels certain that this will buy Christ's freedom, but even on his way to try to bargain for Christ's life, he encounters a woman who is being threatened with assault and murder in payment for her father's death. Again, he offers the pearl, his final possession, as ransom for her life. Now he truly has nothing. All that he had intended to give in worship, he has given in the service of humanity. To aid to his trials, Artaban was struck by a stone from a falling structure. 
caused by the earthquake that accompanied the crucifixion. He is certain now that he will die without ever seeing his Lord. But as he lies bleeding and dying, he hears a faint voice from far off. Verily I say unto thee, Inasmuch as thou hast done unto one of the least of my brethren, thou hast done unto me. Hearing this, Artaban, the fourth wise man, dies with the happy knowledge that his gifts were received by his Lord. At last I understood. <clears throat> well, at first I had thought the wise man to be not so wise at all for missing his chance to witness the first Christmas, for giving away all his possessions, for having spent his entire life ministering to others, it all became clear to me. Artaban was certainly the wisest and the most worthy of all of the wise men. I couldn't wait to tell the story to Mama and Papa. They had brought with them a tradition of storytelling and listened intently. <clears throat> when I finished, they looked at each other for some time in silence. Then Mama spoke. That's a nice story, Felice, she said, and it's a true, when you give what you have to help someone else, it's a like giving to God. Papa asked, what are you going to give the nice library lady? Gee, I thought, I don't have anything to give her. I know, Mama said, I'll make her a nice dish of ravioli. Ravioli, I shouted. I was certain my precious friend, who had just presented me with such a sophisticated gift, would scoff at Mama's ravioli. <clears throat> I wanted to give her rubies, frankincense, or at least myrrh, whatever that was. As usual, my protestations carried little weight, and I was soon on my way to the library with a dish full of homemade ravioli and a jar of rich red sauce both wrapped securely in brown paper bags. On the way, I contemplated all the ways in which I could dispose of the gift. They would never know. I considered dropping it into a drain, throwing it behind the food market, or dumping it into a crushed trash can. But conscience prevailed and propelled me into the library. There I discovered my love seated behind the checkout desk. Leo, she greeted me warmly as I entered. I brought you a present, I explained, extending the arm bags at arm's length. It's kind of dumb, I stammered. It's something to eat for later. She eagerly took the package and peered into the brown bag, holding the ravioli dish. Her eyes lit up, lit up brightly. Ravioli, she exclaimed. Oh, I love ravioli. Thank you. It's not a dumb gift at all. It's a real treasure, more precious than jewels. More precious than jewels, I thought. Yes, of course. I finally and truly understood the story of the other wise men. Mama's ravioli took on a very special meeting. Merry Christmas, everyone. Christmas time is here, a time to reconcile, reconcile with God and reconcile with man. Peace on earth, good will to all men, was the song the angel sang at Jesus' birth. Christmas is Jesus Christ. God came down to live with us. Christmas is Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, Son of God and Son of Man. Emmanuel means God with us. Christmas is Jesus Christ, God came down to live with us. Christmas is Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, Son of God and Son of Man. Emmanuel means God with us.
Jesus. Merry Christmas, Trinity family. Um, I have a favorite chi uh, memory from childhood that's gone into my adulthood. Um, as a little girl, every Christmas Eve, before we could open gifts, um, my dad would always, we would join round in a circle and um, he would read the Christ birth story uh, from the book of Luke. And then we would all close with saying the Lord's Prayer together and we couldn't open gifts. I mean, gifts were not a thing until this had taken place. Um, I grew, I, as I grew older, um, got married, had my own children. Um, we would join with my dad and mom and he continued that tradition. Uh, until he passed away, uh, unbeknownst to us the first Christmas, we found that he had taped himself reading the Christmas story uh, because he wanted to leave that uh, for us. So after my dad passed away, we continued the tradition by playing uh, the recording of my dad reading the scripture from Luke uh, of Christ's birth. Um, my kids got older and in my little family unit, we would listen to Papa reading it before opening gifts. And then as my kids became older and readers, we would switch off and on. And some years, my children, it would like be an honor for them to read it uh, for the family. Now this year, uh, my soon-to-be nine-year-old grandson, Oliver, just might be the one to read the story of Jesus' birth from the book of Luke. Um, it's a special memory and I know it's a, a overused cliche, but it does remind us and keep us in tune with the reason for the season. So I wish you Merry Christmas everyone and good health and joy and uh, a blessed 2023. I'm the Christmas search engine, and I can help you find anything related to- DIY Christmas decorations. Oh, oh okay. Um, let's jump right in. Here we go. <laughs> what date Christmas this year? Uh, December 25th. What date Christmas next year? 
December 25th. Song that goes. Um, I think I know what you're looking for. How cook ham. Okay. How cook ham fast? Uh. Oh, ham flamethrower recipe. Wait, what? Christmas present, mom. Nice. Cheap. Nice. What day Christmas 2035? Are you serious? Is Santa Claus real? Uh, you should maybe ask your parents about that. Gift wrap bowling ball. Please be careful. Custom dog Christmas. Sorry, what? Christmas dog custom cute. Oh, you mean costume? Christmas dog costume cute! Gift wrap accordion. Uh, that's gonna be tricky. Can I drink expired eggnog? No. What happens if drank expired eggnog? Why'd you even ask me in the first place? Dealing with relatives. Okay. Dealing with nosy relatives. Oh, uh, well. Dealing with my nosy, overbearing relatives who won't stay out of my business. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's pretty much all the same stuff. <laughs> Gift wrap a saddle. Who are you buying this stuff for? Santa Claus riding a unicorn. Santa Claus riding a unicorn socks. Is that a thing? Search it up. Oh wow, here they are. Take my money. Norwegian tree skirts. How many lights, one outlet? Elf pajamas. Dog singing Christmas carols. <sighs> oh, hello. What is Christmas really about? <laughs> I've got just the thing. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So, Jesus? <laughs> Jesus. May I? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <gasps> How fix burnt ham? Okay. You know what? Forget it. Pizza delivery Christmas Eve. <laughs> no problem. 